Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm uh, thankful to be in your presence once again with the Word of God. I trust that God has been in your uh, in your lives and uh, richly blessing each one of you with His presence. Um, I am going to continue after a uh, little bit of a break. I'm going to continue in our series that we've been talking about, which is called "Looking Unto Jesus." And um, if you'll remember, um, I don't have the graphic here with me today, but if you'll remember, we first talked about um, the forerunners of Christ. We went through uh, prominent men of God in the Old Testament that pointed to and were a shadow of Christ. And then uh, we started the first part of the life of Christ on earth, and which was about the birth of Christ. And we spent uh, a couple of weeks talking about uh, the birth of Christ. And I'm going to stay in that area, general area today, which is talking about um, the birth and early life of Christ and want to bring attention to um, a certain aspect uh, about that. So um, as we have spoken about before, um, each of the four Gospels highlight um, a different angle or perspective of the, of the life of Christ and his ministry on earth. So Matthew uh, writes from the uh, perspective of Christ as king. Mark rep- uh, writes from the perspective of Christ as the servant. And Luke represents uh, or writes from the perspective of Christ as a man, and John uh, writes from the perspective of uh, his godship or from his spiritual uh, side. So in the same way, how the family of Christ, the earthly family of Christ, uh, also is depicted in, um, in, in a different way in each of the Gospels. So. What I mean by that is, in Matthew, a um, lot of the attention is, you know, it starts off with the genealogy of Christ, and it goes down from the lineage of the kings of Israel, and then um, the account of his birth is written from the perspective of uh, Joseph, his earthly father, and how Joseph was uh, given direction uh, of what to do and even told about what his newly betrothed uh, uh, woman uh, is about to be pregnant, uh, even though she was a virgin, right? So so while Matthew uh, writes from that perspective, Luke takes a different approach, and you can see that everything that uh, Luke writes about, uh, about the initial life of Christ is from the angle of uh, his mother, uh, Mary, and um, I did not plan to speak about uh, Mary, uh, or we did not coordinate speaking about Mary uh, to fall exactly on what, uh, uh, you know, at least America celebrates as Mother's Day, but it just happened. So, so I'm going to be talking to you about Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, and the account of her life. Um, and before I get to that, just one thing I wanted to highlight is that um, going further in from the perspective of Luke that he writes in, one thing that you see is he writes to shed light on ordinary people. So Mary, you know, in that culture would have been a regular person, also not you know, generally talked about as um, somebody, you know, usually when you talk to talk about a family, you talk about a man's perspective, right? Uh, but Luke took the time, wrote a couple of long chapters uh, about uh, Mary and her perspective, her side of the story. In the same way, also, uh, Luke talks about the experience of the shepherds who had a visitation from the angels explaining or talking about the birth of Christ again, The angle of an ordinary man, uh, ordinary people of a shepherd, right? Because Matthew spent more time talking about the Magi's and how they went to the King Herod and all the kingly uh, aspect of things. Luke spent time highlighting 
that Christ came as a human being, right? As an ordinary person just like you and I. So just like, you know, the gospel uh, is for everybody, right? That's why in Isaiah it says the mountains shall be brought down and the valleys shall be lifted up. Amen? So nobody in the kingdom of God, man or woman, right? Palace or on the streets is viewed by God as better than the other, right? So that's something we have to understand is that God values everybody equally who are in, uh, and all are viewed by God as precious in His sight. Amen? Uh, um, I say that because many times we, uh, because uh, it has been a man-centric culture, at least from where we come from, uh, you know, women have been diminished or sidelined many times and that is not the biblical perspective uh, of, of things and how uh, the New Testament writers especially uh, gave importance to women. And so that we can see with how they're displayed uh, here by Luke himself um, uh, with the account of Mary. So just wanted to give you that introduction. Um, is, and also, and I will, before I start about Mary herself, I just want to say even in Proverbs 31 where it talks about um, the virtuous woman, uh, Proverbs 31, verse 11. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. For this all to work out, Joseph had to trust in Mary, right? Yes, of course, he heard from God himself. But God, Joseph viewed her as a virtuous woman that he could trust. Because what the news that you know, he would have heard would have been quite catastrophic for their family, right? Would have tarnished his reputation and her reputation and his whole future in that society was at stake. But Joseph viewed her as a virtuous woman and safely trusted in Mary. Amen? So we have to understand the place that women have in our lives, right? And not to diminish or sideline uh, the role of women or the important women and wonderful women God has given in our lives. Amen? And so, but we'll have to balance that with the roles and the order that God has put in place also, right? And we'll get, get to that in a minute. So, okay, so Mary... Uh, so coming to the topic of Mary, I just want to kind of cover the whole arc of Mary's uh, mention mentions in the Bible, and it starts with her being a virgin, uh, betrothed to Joseph, right, and and then it goes into talking about a glimpse of their family life, and then it gives you a glimpse of what her role was when Jesus transitioned. To his public life and also a very small glimpse later in the end about uh, what she was doing after the ascension of Christ. So starting off with uh, in the initial part of Mary's life, she was, uh, like I said, I'm going to go quickly through this because we're familiar with these, but you know, initially we, we find that Mary was found in, you know, we can see in Luke chapter 1 uh, verse uh, 26 and a few verses down from there and it says and in the sixth month the angel Gabriel which is the sixth month after Elizabeth her cousin was pregnant uh, six month angel Gabriel was sent from God and to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph it was a ho- of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary and the angel came in unto her and said hail Thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, 
and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing that shall, which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And then I'll just read verse 37 and 38. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. So a couple of things. We all hear about this um, passage about the salutation of the angel to Mary. Uh, which starts out with hail, thou art highly favored. I just want to take a moment to talk about that part for a second because there has been false doctrines and heresy taught out of this salutation. So because hail means be joyful. It means greetings. It does not mean be worshipped. So we have made, uh, not we, uh, there, there are denominations that have made a prayer out of this to pray to Mary um, and, and have made a whole uh, heretical teaching out of uh, uh, you know, viewing Mary as a mediator with Christ. And I know we all, our church does not teach that, but I just wanted to make that clear in case you weren't sure that the angel was not worshiping Mary, he was greeting her. And also when it says highly favored and blessed, it was not saying that she is now elevated into this role in the heavenly realm that exalts her above uh, needing a savior who is the man that was going to be born through her. We have to understand her life in, in its completion. And I'll talk about that in a second. So, Mary is not a mediator between us and Christ. We pray to Christ. In fact, 1 Timothy 2.5 says what? There is only one mediator between man and God. The man, Jesus Christ. We don't pray to Mary because she also was a sinner that needed saving by the seed that was born through her, Jesus Christ. Amen? So, also, she was not a virgin her whole life, despite what somebody might teach her. You can read that in several chapters, um, Mar uh, Matthew chapter 13, 55 to 56, Mark 6, 3 to 4. Jesus had half-brothers and sisters. We know they wrote books in the Bible, James and Jude, and Joseph and others, and it even says he has sisters. So she was not a virgin all her life. And she was not somebody to be worshipped or exalted. But as Pentecostals, we should not diminish what she did either. We have to think about what she had to go through and endure to receive this calling upon her life. Does that make sense? She was indeed a virtuous woman and a strong woman. Imagine in that culture what it means to be pregnant without having been openly married to somebody. In a period of her betrothal, which is about a year long. And, and in fact, she was so precious to God, not only did her, he give her this greeting, he did not leave that message from God to just to be passed on from Joseph to her. He came and spoke to her directly. Amen? So we have to understand that, that God speaks to each one of us. You know, we might, we might have a different role in church or in the family, but God speaks to each one of us, man or woman, directly. Amen? And God was ensured that this message was delivered directly to Mary. So she was confident in what was about to happen to her. Amen? You all with me? Amen? Quiet this morning. Okay. All right, so in fact, not only did God speak to her through the angel, she immediately after she heard this later, you can see that she went up to Elizabeth to find out if what she heard was true and found that she was pregnant. And Elizabeth greeted her with the same salutation. 
In verse 42 it says, Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb. So it was confirmed to her that this was from God. This was no ordinary thing that happened to her. So you can see that she believed the word. She immediately submitted to the voice of God. Immediately submitted to the calling of God upon her life. And she sang the song in chapter 1 of Luke verse 46 to 56. <clears throat> so that is the <coughs> initial view of Mary and as it relates to the birth of Christ. And you can see, you know, if you read on further, you can see that, you know, uh, when the, uh, the wise men came, uh, when she was, had given birth and Joseph and Mary received them. So all these mentions of, uh, of, of Mary and it, when the shepherds came, they, all these things, it says again and again, she kept in her heart. So the many times, many things that we, you know, in our family or with regards to our children, you know, God speaks to us and gives us promises about them. Let us treasure those in our heart and hold on to them and believe in them that God will one day bring those to pass. Just like Mary, she was wondering, what are these things people are saying about this child? Yeah, I heard from God, but all these different people I've never met are coming and telling me things about them. And she held on to them and treasured them in her heart. Let us also, you know, uh, uh, be open to people pouring into their lives, our children's lives, and discipling them and ministering to them. And let us all, tre let us treasure and build upon one upon another in our hearts about what God's plans are for them. Amen? Amen. The next thing I want to cover going quickly is the family life. So now, this is where, yes, she was a virtuous woman. She, yes, she was a strong woman. And yes, she was uh, highly favored and blessed among women. But God did not ignore the order for the family that he established. Amen? Joseph was still the head of the family. Joseph was still, uh, when he, they got married, was given the authority over the family. And she was submissive in that order that God put in place. We can see that in Matthew cha uh, cha uh, chapter 1. Uh, it describes uh, how, you know, when, when God told Joseph uh, that, you know, to escape into Egypt. It was God, God was telling Joseph not to marry. Or when uh, after Egypt, when it was time to come back, God spoke to Joseph to come back. He was responsible for directing his family and had the headship of the family. The truth to be learned there is that we all have our own anointing and our roles in different parts in the family or in the church. But we are also under the authority of another. And we have to be respectful of that. Amen. God does not, did not undo the order that he himself put into place. He didn't say, oh, okay, so my son is going to come upon the earth. He will descend down onto the earth and all these other things don't matter. No, he worked within the confines of the, the word that he himself spoke. Does that make sense? So God's order was still active and alive. She had an active role in parenting. You know, we know the story of... <clears throat> a story of... When uh, Jesus was 12, they went to uh, uh, Jerusalem and they, he stayed back and they didn't realize, uh, you know, um, uh, realize that he had stayed back and he was teaching. And you could see that her role, like she didn't just take a back seat because she thought, oh, this is the son of God. I don't know what to do. Right. I don't you know, I'm just going to let things happen. No, he was on. Jesus was under the discipline of his parents until he came of age. Amen. It says that very clearly in Luke chapter 2. Is that he was um, uh, subject to them after coming back. Right? But he did not neglect the ministry that he had either. So these two have to be in balance. We have to understand the calling our children have. And support and, and uh, fertilize and nourish that. But don't neglect your duties as parents. 
to bring them under the discipline and the authority that God has given you. Amen? So some people, uh, sometimes, you know, your kids might be very talented and we, you know, you almost sometimes uh, revere that and that take your, your position as parents sometimes take a back seat to in, in support of the whatever gifts or talents they have. That should not be the case. It should be in balance. You have to still uh, have your children and your family in order until they come of age. Amen? And Jesus was showing as an example of that also, even in his early childhood. He was under the authority of his parents during that time. Um, we know that um, at some uh, at, you know, about the age of 30, Jesus transitioned uh, to public ministry. And you can see the role of Mary receding uh, at that point. And you can see that very clearly in the story of the wedding at Cana, right? So they ran out of uh, wine, and uh, Mary, being the parent there, who also happened to be there, and Jesus was this, this disciple, she thought she had to do something, right? And go and tell Jesus they're out of wine. And what did Jesus say? Woman, what have I to do with you? My hour has not yet come. That is a clear transition that Jesus has now left home. Well, he, he left home before that, but the transition had taken place. He was not now under the authority of his earthly parents, but he is now ministering in the authority of his public ministry. So at some point as parents, we have to take a back seat to our, when our kids reach that maturity. We have to be okay with letting them live in their lives, but trust that the word that you sowed in their lives will take root and bring fruit. Don't neglect the word that you had to sow in the time you have to sow it. Amen? Sow in due time as they're growing up under your stewardship. But when it's time for them to move on, you have to be okay with taking a back seat. Amen? And still have a role in their lives to support and be there. Right? Not just kicking them out, but... Uh, but we have to be okay that we struggle with that in our culture. That we still try to enforce our beliefs upon them and our, what we want for their lives upon them. We have to be okay with transitioning away so that they can live adult lives and build their own families. Sometimes when we neglect this order in, our, in the family, things go out of order, right? That's when there's disruption and there's commotion and contentions with you know, newly brought husband or wife or and the mother-in-law, father-in-law, all that dynamic has to work in harmony, right? That's sometimes because when we forget our role in our children's lives. So be respectful of that. Amen? I want to leave that there. <clears throat> so, but, but Jesus did not neglect... Oh, well, before I go there, one more thing. Um, um, yeah. In fact, we can even further see that there was a time when Jesus' uh, brother, half-brothers, and Mary was waiting to see him. And he was ministering, and he would not take time to go see them. It's not because he was dishonoring them, but he's saying, I'm now at a different stage of life. Who is my mother and my brothers, he asked. It is those who listen to my word, right? Uh, I would encourage you not to be so harsh ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> with your parents. Oh. But the point there is just showing again that Mary had receded. I'm just making the point that this is why we don't pray to Mary. She is not a deity. She is not exalted. She was also a sinner that needed to be redeemed. But God used her in his plan. And she was blessed for that. She was submissive to God's plan. But once she was done with a role, she receded into the background. Amen? We also sometimes, we try to hold on to things, whether it's in ministry, when God is telling us to move on, we try to hold on to position and power and things that we should not be holding on to anymore. Whether it's a pulpit, whatever it is, when it's time to recede into the background, we should be open to that. Amen? And that is in God's plan. No man is exalted above another, but God uses people 
in due time and in his plan. Okay, um, last point about Mary. <clears throat> so, in, you know, Mary and it is, so it mentions that she followed with the other women in Matthew 27, 56. You can see that she was, the, all the disciples abandoned and ran away, but she and the women followed to, through his crucifixion, right? Was watching and was there with, you know, as you can see, a mother will never abandon, right, their child. And she followed and watched what was happening. But you can see that Jesus did not neglect his earthly responsibility, right? In John chapter 19, it says, he, on the cross itself, looked at John, because he was the oldest, it was his responsibility, handed Mary over to John to receive as his own mother. Now, why could that happen? A couple of reasons that I thought about. One, Joseph likely passed away at some point between the age of 12 of Jesus and his public ministry, because you don't hear Joseph being talked about. So if she was a widow, um, and if she was a follower of Christ and his brothers were not yet, maybe she did not have a permanent home that she felt comfortable. And so she asked John to receive her as his mother. Again, that's some of my opinion. But the point there is Jesus did not neglect his earthly responsibility even as he was on the cross. No matter what ministry or high positions we have, or whatever levels we reach in this world, never neglect your responsibility to your parents or to your family. We're, we're never get to, gonna get to a point where we're too good for that. Jesus himself did not from the cross and neither should we. We should always be faithful to our family and everybody that God has entrusted to us in our life. Amen? And finally, you can see Mary in the upper room in Acts chapter 1 verse 14. After the ascension of Christ, Mary was with the disciples waiting and in one accord communing together. And I trust that she was there when the day of Pentecost happened and she also received the Spirit. It doesn't say, but I believe that happened. Amen? So that's why I say she was also in need of a Savior. But she was transitioned from being the virgin who bore the promise to being seeing that happen before our eyes, but also receiving that promise herself in our life and being part of the salvation of God. And throughout of the work that she was faithful in, she also was blessed. She also was redeemed through the work that she was faithful in. And we can see that whole arc of her life through the gospel. So when we look at Mary's life, we have to take a balanced perspective. You know, not to worship her, but neither to diminish her role either. It has to be a balanced perspective. She was a strong and virtuous woman, but she also understood her role in the family. She understood that she bore the Son of God in her womb, but she was okay transitioning into the, back, uh, into the backstage when it was time to do that. So everything in life has to be in balance and in harmony with the Word of God. And so we should not be afraid to stand for the Word of God if that is true to the Word of God. Amen? Um, and last point, and I invite the worship team to come upon. I would just want to summarize, uh, go beyond what, talking about Mary and summarize just a couple of things, four points about uh, Christian maturity in, in parallel to Mary's life. We can draw a parallel to Mary uh, and her ministry here. Four things I just thought about, about how we can think about ourselves, about Christian maturity. One is recognizing your call. Recognizing the responsibility that God has given us, no matter the price you might have to pay, God is asking you to be faithful and see it until the end. Like it says in Philippians, He is able to finish the work that He began in you until the very end. Be faithful to the calling that God placed upon you. Know what God gifting that God has given you and be faithful to it. Second is, be submissive to God's authority and His order for the church and for the family. And while you wait on His promise, in the waiting, be faithful. Know that God will fulfill what He has promised. It might take a while, 
but the messiah that is promised came and he fulfilled his ministry and she waited to see that through her life god has made us promises and wait and be faithful in the waiting god is not going to be delayed third being led by the spirit if mary is and her parenting was our earlier stages of our christianity we have to transition from you know being under schoolmasters and instructors to being mature and being led by the spirit what i mean that is as you grow and mature in your spiritual life we have to reach a point where we believe things for ourselves and we don't need you know people to constantly instruct us and tell us what to do we have to reach a point of maturity where we are moving forward by the leading of the spirit sometimes i feel like we just want waiting for somebody to tell us what to do give us instruction god is telling us that's why in the wedding of cana you see that you know mary is trying to instruct you know the old school master trying to instruct jesus and jesus is saying no my spirit uh, ministry has reached a new level now the spirit is going to guide me i i'm going to tell the people what to do at some point we have to move forward in our ministry allow god to guide you and lead you by his spirit and reach new levels in your ministry amen and not just being shackled by the old and lastly the last point about christian maturity is no matter what le- i already said this level you reach or position or stature you reach it is not some a great thing to neglect your responsibilities on the earth you should always be faithful to the earthly responsibilities that god has given you whether it's taking care of your parents or or your children or your wife or be faithful at home neglecting those responsibilities is not a sign of reaching this new level be faithful in the place that god has placed you and move on by the leading of the spirit may his name be glorified